Okay, if we could ask everyone to please come in and take your seats. Um, we'd like to get going both because we have a really, really extraordinary panel of people here who I guarantee you're going to want to hear from uh, in this moment. And our other uh, complication is that we have a keynote, uh, Gary Locke, who is going to need to go right after this panel because he has a plane that he needs to catch. And so please help us help him catch that plane. Uh, and with that, it is my just tremendous honor and pleasure uh, to introduce you to three people who are fighters in the fight against hate in every respect. And I'm going to start with Tonya Gersh, and I'm going to ask Tonya to introduce the other panelists who are here with her, because as we've talked about, a lot of people, or would Eunice like to do the introducing? Eunice, okay, Eunice is going to do the introducing, um, but I will just share with you that I have met so many people uh, in the course of this summit, uh, but few who have moved me and inspired me as much as the panelists on this panel. So it's a real honor to have them. Eunice Law, if you want to head us off. Thank, Thank you. you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Eunice Lau. I'm a filmmaker, and I'm here today with Tony Gush and Steven Jacobs, um, who are collaborating with me in the making of my new film called Triumph of Her Will, which examines um, white supremacy and trying to understand the rise of anti-Semitism in present-day America. Um, I, for those who are not familiar with Tanya's story, I just want to read a short bio um, to give you the background to what happened to her. So, in December of 2016, Andrew Anglin, founder of the neo-Nazi website The Daily Stormer, orchestrated a horrific harassment campaign to terrorize Tanya and her family. So, uh, with anti-Semitic death threats and messages, and they were very inspired. Their name was taken from the Nazi party newspaper Daily Stormer, um, and it is actually the Daily Stormer is actually an uh, American far-right, white supremacist, misogynist, Holocaust denial commentary, and message board website that advocates for a second genocide of Jews. Anglin actually encouraged his followers to take action after Tanya agreed to sell real estate for the mother of white nationalist Richard Spencer. When Spencer learned that his mother contacted a Jewish agent, he made online accusations against Tanya, falsely accusing her of blackmailing his mother into selling her property. The Spencer's accusations snowballed into a troll storm after Anglin targeted her in order to defend Mrs. Spencer. He shared personal information and the social media accounts of Tanya and her family, including her son, who was only 12 at that time. The campaign also targeted two rabbis in Whitefish, human rights activist Ina Albert, and any Whitefish residents and business owners that trolls believe were Jewish. So Tanya decided to fight back. With the help of the Southern Poverty Law Center, she filed a lawsuit against Anglin. In, 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, she won $14 million in damages. A team of lawyers is still searching for Andrew Anglin and his assets. And the lawsuit is over, but her work has just begun. So, um, before I go to Stephen's um, uh, bio, I just want to you know, throw the first question to, to Tanya. If you can share with us you know, what happened to you after you, begin, you became the target of the neo-Nazis. So I think the most important thing to understand about me is that I'm not an activist. I'm a mom. I'm a mom from Montana. And um, Tanya, I was named after my great-grandmother that came here through Ellis Island. Neil is my middle name. My father named me after his cousin who died in Vietnam and turned my parents into lifetime hippie uh, activists. 
and Rosenstein, which is a, a, was my maiden name. I came, uh, my family is all from Brooklyn. They worked job to job to, just to survive, and they were brought up in a generation that said, don't be so Jewish, just, just be American, just assimilate. You're gonna be much more safe and you're gonna be much more successful if you're just, just don't be so Jewish. And, um, and now I'm a Gersh. Um, I have a loving husband and I'm a real estate agent in a town that I set my life up to, um, it's like I live at summer camp. I had a peaceful, amazing, incredible life that I created for myself and it was taken away from me in one second. It was taken away, it was tossed around, it was turned upside down and it was terrorized because I'm Jewish. A neo-Nazi website decided that I was the most hated Jew in America. They decided that they should, they don't have to even touch me in order to destroy me. That they could, through the internet, drive me to the brink of suicide. That's what they tried to do. And they weren't far off. It hurt me physically, mentally, socially. It took away my reputation. It took away my job and it took away my sense of safety forever. This will follow my children forever. And it happened in a split second and it ha can happen to you in a split second. So, um, while trying to understand why this is happening to Tanya, I actually decided to um, you know, look for answers in our history, and particularly, you know, the, um, the anti-Semitism that happened during the war. And so my research brought me to Stephen, who was one of the youngest survivors of um, the Holocaust. And so a little background into um, Stephen is, um, so Stephen is born in Poland three months before the start of the war. And he was only an infant when his family, along with all Polish Jews, were forced to leave their homes and imprisoned into ghettos. His father, who is a physician, was part of the underground resistance in the ghetto, and he fought to save the lives of wounded resistance fighters. Stephen was only five when the ghetto and labor camp where he was imprisoned were liquidated. Along with his family, he was sent to Buchenwald concentration camp in Weimar, Germany. At Buchenwald, Jacob managed to survive both through luck and the assistance of the underground resistance that worked to save children. In the weeks before liberation, when the Germans were trying to liquidate the camp, his father, with the help of the underground, hit him basically in the tuberculosis ward of the camp hospital to make sure that he was not discovered. No Jew could work as a physician in the camp, but his father got him signed, himself assigned in, as an orderly at the hospital. So after surviving the camp, the Holocaust, the family immigrated to the US in 1948, settling in New York City. Stephen would go on to become a prominent New York architect, founding his own firm, which includes a partnership with his wife, Annie Pepper, who is an interior designer. Stephen's distinct signature can be found throughout the city in neighborhoods such as the Upper West Side, the Meatpacking District, and Chelsea, as well as the other boroughs like Brooklyn. He's also the architect of the Holocaust Memorial in Buchenwald, Weimar, Germany, and Tirana, uh, Albania. So Stephen, I just want to ask you, having suffered and survived the Holocaust, is it shocking to you to basically see the Nazi playbook repeating itself in your lifetime? It's totally shocking. But the most important thing that I have to say is I am a witness to where Tanya's story could potentially end, where this type of hatred ultimately leads. 
I was only a child. But even as a child, I have to tell you that I remember too much. Um, my story is not unusual. I guess the only unusual part about my story is that my immediate family survived. Uh, my father, my brother, and myself, and we were reunited with my mother, who was shipped with the other women and ended up in Bergen-Belsen, um, which was uh, liberated by the British. Um, I, I must say, I, I must say that this, um, that the ultimate goal of fascism is the same. And my life has been devoted to recognizing fascism wherever it occurs and to trying to call people's attention to where this could lead. So, how does white supremacy function? White supremacy is only one manifestation of a large, a much larger role. Fascism is an evil ideology. It's an evil ideology that it intends to subjugate people. And as such, um, its ultimate goal is to create a different, this different, to play up the differentiation between people. Germany, in the early 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, had the largest communist party outside the Soviet Union, the largest socialist party in Europe, um, the uh, uh, largest uh, organized uh, labor movement. And yet within that context, the Nazis were successful in using anti-Semitism as a political tool, which was a Nazi tactic it frightens me that we have seen that same Nazi tactic uh, targeting immigrants, targeting homosexuals, targeting anybody that is different. But the goal is always the same. The goal is political. And people have to be very conscious and very aware when they see these things happen, they are seeing a repeat of the same old Nazi tactic. Thank you. Tanya, so in the process of us filming and telling the story, what have you learned from the various people we met along the way? Well, oh gosh, I've learned so much. You know, I was a victim, right? But I also got a chance to be a fighter. I had these two little boys that I was raising. They were nine and 12 at the time. And they looked up at me in the middle of this troll storm. The, the Daily Stormer had 300,000 followers, by the way. So when they sent this terror attack on my family, it wasn't like they trickled in. It was like they invaded everything about our lives. And I had these two little boys saying, holy moly, like, what is our life, what has our life become? My oldest son was in the process of studying for his bar mitzvah, and I had to tell him, yes, you have to keep studying. Yes, oh, by the way, you've been, we've been hated for many, 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 many years. The Jews have pretty much always been hated, but yes, you need to keep studying. And I somehow had to show them that what he was studying was worth studying and worth fighting for. So we decided to fight. We had the opportunity, and I wanted them to remember being a fighter and not a victim. 
I decided to take some responsibility, even though family and friends said, are you crazy? You're gonna fight Nazis? It was like unheard of. And all I could think of was, what are they gonna remember? How are they gonna remember this time period in life? And how are we going to survive it? So SPLC showed up at my door. I had the most unbelievable team of social justice attorneys and activists, and they taught me They taught me, number one, I'm not alone. Whether it's LGBTQ, Muslim, Black, Asian, Native American hate, if there's hate in the world, I've got to stand up for it. And we've all got to stand up for each other. We've got to stick together. I've also learned, I also learned in the process that the emergency broadcast system sirens were blaring super, super loud for anti-Semitism. And I had no idea. I had my head stuck in the ground. I hadn't watched the news since I, let, I graduated high school because I was sick of my parents getting so upset about what was going on in the news. So I decided to shut my ears and just, just worry about my grassroots roots issues. So I had no idea that there was co this kind of hate in the world. I learned that uh, America is hateful. We're probably the very first exporters of hate because Hitler was definitely inspired by the Jim Crow laws. And I, I learned that the hate against me and my children was a calculated domestic terrorist tactic. And they're organized, like really organized. My pain started with hail Trump, hail our people, hail America, remember that? That's what started my pain. Soon after that, the troll, the, the troll storm hit my family. Soon after that, a march on Whitefish was planned. The march on Whitefish was planned and they were gonna end it at my house. So I experienced waking up in the middle of the night, and this is why Stephen and I sit on a stage together, ladies and gentlemen. This is why we are sharing the same, similar, but very different but very connected story we both experienced, waking up in the middle of the night and wondering if we should wake the children and run for our lives because we're Jewish. In this day and age, we should be embarrassed. So it happened in Whitefish. They couldn't get the, they couldn't get the, March together in Whitefish, it was way too cold. It was like zero degree weather, they didn't expect it. They also didn't expect a little town in Whitefish, Montana that was so filled with love that they simply wouldn't allow it. They made them jump through way too many hoops. So you know what they did? They planned it in Charlottesville. Between Charlottesville and Whitefish, there was the shooting of Richard Collins there was the attack on Taylor Dubson. And then Charlottesville happened and I was on the edge of my seat because it was just a few months later and I was actually still in the process of being attacked. And I watched my worst nightmare and people saying, oh, it's just online, you should be okay. No, I watched my worst nightmare come to life, ladies and gentlemen. They were marching with my head on the picket sign. I didn't see my head on it, but I thought it was there. One of the, well, one of the big elements that I think Tanya has just touched on, which differentiate our stories, while Tanya's stories has a good ending, because the town of White Sh Whitefish stood up against fascism, united, against fascism, while we were abandoned by our friends, our neighbors, 
and the entire world. It's sort of as proof how easy this could be stopped if people organize and unite and put up a common front whenever this arises, whenever these creatures crawl out from under rocks, that they be crushed. And if that happens, this could be stopped. Fascism could have been stopped in Spain, but it wasn't because the world abandoned Spain. They abandoned, they abandoned us. And that's why all alone we suffered six million mortals. See, I don't have a degree or I'm not educated on the rise of hate in America or anti-Semitism. I'm not an expert on on the statistics, but what I am an expert on knowing and recognizing is that this is ridiculous. These are the underbellies of the world. These are the maggots. Look, there's three things you should probably teach your children, right? Brush your teeth, wash your tush, and don't be a Nazi. It's kind of that simple. And so, now that I am an activist, I guess this is what, I, like, I think it came official today, right? <laughs> now that I am, I wanna break it down into really, really basic terms for people. That hate has no place in our country. Hate is hurtful, and you cannot hide behind your First Amendment rights and hate on people and have that hurt those people and get away with it. You will get slapped with a lawsuit. We will continue filing lawsuits. And we will not tolerate that kind of behavior. I want to scare the shit out of them like they scared the shit out of me. Can I tell you, I'm using this word very carefully because that's what happened to me. You know that term, scare the shit out of you? It really happens, everyone. I had to go to therapy to learn how to not pee my pants every time I felt compromised. I've had to learn to not run into the bathroom and throw up every time somebody tells me a Jewish joke, or I hear something that just scares the heck out of me. It's very real, and let's break it down and inspire. We need Hollywood, everyone. We need Hollywood so bad. We need a movement. We need, we need that energy of all you need is love, singing and dancing, and follow the leads of the LGBTQ movement that when they were hurt and suffering and people were terrorizing them the worst, they didn't fight. They didn't protest. They threw parades. They showed the world how fabulous they were through music and parades and celebration and parties until we just plain old fell in love with them. So that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to try to create and bring that energy back of being politically correct. There's nothing wrong with it. Let's bring a little back into the world. It's about time. Do you remember the Glee generation, everyone? I was raising the Glee generation. There was a time, a like short moment in, his, in t recent history that kids would literally sing and dance and parade around kids that were different from them and not just accept them, but put them on pedestals. Like we were almost there. We, we could touch it. The, I want it back. Let's figure out a way together to make that happen. One of the... I, I, I was fortunate in that, as an architect, I was given the opportunity 
to design two Holocaust memorials. Uh, the first in, 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 in Buchenwald was very personal to me because I, I was there. Um, uh, although I have to tell you, it was a very cathartic experience. The second memorial, which was only recently completed, is a somewhat different story in Tirana, Albania. And it's a story that just has become, uh, the people are just trying to find out about what happened in this little country, which saved every one of its Jews, not many maybe 1,500, maybe 2,000. But as an occupied country, as an occupied country, they proved that if you wanted to, you could resist. And it sort of puts a shame on the rest of the world that it's only in a little country like Albania that in fact, you had more Jews after the war than you did in the beginning. I think so. Um, I, I kind of want to, you know, share with you a little uh, film trailer that we put together just to give you an idea of why, you know, I was so inspired to tell this story and what we hope to do out of it um, is that by understanding what happened to Stephen and to Tanya and to understand their pain that we can also use this film to help heal um, survivors of hate like them and for us to find a way out, not just to, to heal but also to move forward. So can we play the, um, the trailer please? I came home, the house was completely dark. My husband was home, and I said, what's happening? He pulled up the website. I saw my picture. You're a dirty kike whore. Are you ready for an old-fashioned troll storm? I was born in large Poland. My family was a very well-to-do family. One memory I have, when a Polish boy spit at me, cause I was Jewish. Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! Emails started, flooded in. I answered the phone, I heard gunshots. The Nazis organized groups of violent thugs which attacked Jews. Barton Whitefish was organized, was supposed to end at my house. The Nazis loaded us into a death train to deport us to the labor camp. We have to run for our lives. My husband said, pack our bags. I said, where are we going? My father was very active in the resistance against the Germans. Why did my dad risk his life to do what he did? Because there were no other options. I'm joined now by Richard Cohn, president of the Southern Poverty Law Center. They said, Tanya, we have been trying to get these neo-Nazis for years. With your help, we can take them down. Let's sue these people together. And I said, absolutely. I don't consider what I do to be heroic, but like my father, I do things that I think need to be done. Just the average day in the life of a mom, right? <laughs> um, so, Stephen, um, you know, you have been uh, a lot of inspiration and 
given us so much wisdom in this journey telling the story. Both Tani and I are very grateful. And before we conclude today, we just kind of wanted to, you know, ask you again, um, how do you think we can fight this hate? Excuse me, uh, Eunice, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Sure. I just wanted to ask you, how do you think we can fight this hate? How? Can we fight this hate? How can we fight hate? The first thing is to recognize what it is and to, and, and, and to react immediately. Complacency is the worst thing that can happen. And we know that we saw what happened in Europe that people who didn't want to hear, who didn't want to see, were almost equally responsible. So taking a stand, taking a stand, expressing yourself, participating in public displays, like what happened in Whitefish, if this could happen everywhere, where these sorts of sentiments start uh, 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 becoming visible, and there is a united movement to crush it, they are weak. They will go away. We see that, and we see it over and over again. But when they can dominate, when people say, well, they're not after me, so I don't have to pay any attention. That's when things go from bad to worse. Thank you. Tanya, why, besides sharing with us how we can do this, move forward, could you also share with us why is it that you're willing to put yourself out there again? Because you know that once our story goes public, there's going to be, you're going to be a target again. So why are you doing this? It's amazing how many people will ask me why I am doing this and I'm willing to do it. Because, and they'll say, gosh, I don't think I would do it. And it's always so shocking to me that they wouldn't. I guess I'm just wired and hurt and enough of a mama bear and had bad enough of an experience to say, you know, it already happened. May as well not stop now. If this happened to another person, if a troll storm happened to another person, I'm not sure I could survive that. Heck yeah, I'm willing to put myself out there. And most important, I'm willing to lead by example. I'm willing to encourage others that no matter what they're going through, the most important thing that they can do is educate in any way they can figure out how whether it's through film, through public speaking, or just one-on-one -on -one conversations, we can't give up. This is a, we are on the side that should naturally win, everyone. All you need is love. I mean, you know, all you need is love. Let's bring it back, you know, all you need is love. Remember when that was just part of everyday life? All you need is love, love. I actually told Eunice I might sing. <laughs> love is all you need. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So I want to thank this absolutely amazing, amazing panel. And Stephen, though you couldn't be with us here today, we're so grateful to you for your words. And for all of you who are watching, the call out is to you. 
And if you came to listen to global speakers and hear about data, that's all terrific. But I think what they so powerfully shared with you is that part of the solution is in every single person who is watching this today. So don't assume it's somebody else's issue. It's your issue. It's our issue. And we're so privileged to all of you for sharing that powerful story with us. Thank you.